You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I talk a lot on this podcast about the idea of creating a job-free life for yourself. And I've done lots of episodes in the past about practical topics relating to creating a job-free life, like investing and entrepreneurship and so forth. This episode is about the psychological challenges that you face if you want to create a job-free life for yourself. And in this episode, I'm going to share with you a chapter from the audiobook of my book, Job Free. If you enjoy this episode, you should definitely check out the whole book, Job Free, which you can find in paperback and ebook and audio format on Amazon and Audible. And I'll put links in the show notes to those. If you enjoy this podcast, you can also get access to bonus episodes and many other rewards by becoming a patron on Patreon. And if you're interested in supporting the show, you can find links for that in the show notes too. So without further delay, here's a chapter from my book, Job Free. Chapter 6. The Psychological Challenge One doesn't discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a very long time. André Guide How Peter's Story Ends At the beginning of this book, I told you about Peter, the mentor and friend I met as a teenager. Peter had plans to build a business, earn a million pounds, and become a successful dropout. His vision for creating a job-free life inspired me to start my own journey of entrepreneurship, and he helped me start my business. I was following Peter's path. I adopted the same goal, financial independence and a life free of jobs. But our paths diverged. Over the years, Peter gradually changed. The Sherlock Holmes aspect of his character, his love of ideas, began to disappear. He spoke less about ideas and more about possessions. He began to spend ostentatiously on status symbols. He bought a luxury car and moved into a large house in an exclusive neighbourhood. When we first met, we would talk over a curry takeout at his apartment. Later, I would meet him in restaurants, eventually in places where I needed to wear a suit. Peter became increasingly cynical, especially about relationships. He developed a new preoccupation in life. He wanted to have sex with a lot of beautiful women. He had given up on love. He was not a handsome man, but as he got richer and started to live a more status-oriented lifestyle, he was able to find plenty of beautiful women who wanted to be with him. I did not know it at the time, but the founding of my business was a turning point in my friendship with Peter. He wanted to take a controlling interest in my business, and I did not agree. We worked it out amicably, He lent me the money rather than taking a shareholding, but something had changed and we were never as close afterwards. I gradually lost touch with Peter. I was working extremely hard on my business and making less effort to keep in contact, but I also got the sense that he was less inclined to make himself available to meet up. A few years passed when I didn't see him at all. I finally managed to get Peter to agree to meet with me in 2004 so I could pay back the money that he had lent me to start my business. I was very proud to be able to pay back all the loans with interest because my business was finally making a profit. I met Peter in a cafe in Little Venice, near his new mansion. He congratulated me on my business and listened with a smile as I told him about how things were going but he had a sad expression in his eyes. He looked tired. I asked how he was doing and what had happened in the years since we last met. What Peter said shocked me. I learned that Peter had become fabulously rich. He was now a multi-millionaire and was continuing to make more money. I also learned that he was deeply unhappy. He had been involved in toxic relationships. He told me a story of betrayal, 
violence, heartbreak and isolation. He spoke vaguely of legal conflicts, which I later found out were very serious. Despite his wealth, Peter worked himself into exhaustion and illness repeatedly. He would push himself incredibly hard for months until he would physically collapse, requiring weeks to recuperate. He had always been intensely focused, but as he got older, his body could not take the pressure of these bursts of activity. He developed health problems. I got a sense that Peter did not have anyone to talk to. I had always wanted to be closer friends with him, but I never felt able to get close. I don't think anybody could. I always remembered what Peter had told me a decade earlier about his goal to become a millionaire and retire early. By the time we met in that cafe in 2004, he had long since blown past his £1 million milestone, but he never spoke of his original plans or what he thought of them now. He showed no signs of retiring. Money meant something different to him now. Peter was rich far beyond his original dream but he had not found fulfilment. A couple of months after I saw Peter, I invited him to be a guest of honour at a party to celebrate the five-year anniversary of the founding of my business. We presented him with a gift as thanks for having loaned the money that funded the business in the initial stages. He accepted the gift graciously, but never replied to emails after that night. It was the last time I saw him. I never gave up on Peter's original dream. I always wanted the kind of freedom that Peter had told me about years ago in his little apartment in Greenwich, not the kind of life he eventually chose. Money is a tool for finding freedom. The goal is freedom, not money. Even though our paths diverged, that conversation with Peter had already changed my life. Peter showed me, by example that a job-free life is not just possible, it is feasible. Now that you have listened to this audiobook, you have had your own version of that life-changing conversation. I had Peter as an example to learn from. You have all the people that I've highlighted in this book. Whereas I learned one path to job freedom through startup entrepreneurship, you have four different paths to choose from and I've given you suggestions about how to choose your path. Three Psychological Challenges Whichever path to job freedom you choose, you will encounter psychological challenges on your journey. Regardless of which of the four approaches you take, quitting the rat race requires you to find the courage to be unconventional. All four of these lifestyles are unusual ways to live compared to the debt-ridden, day-by-day, jobbing lifestyle that is the norm. Even though jobs can suck in many ways, they do provide benefits, especially psychological ones. We've focused on how to replace the income you get from a job with income from a job-free life. However, you also need to replace the psychological benefits that a job can give you. In this final chapter, I provide suggestions on three key psychological challenges for creating a job-free life. Number one, the challenge of creating a community outside the ready-made community provided by a job. Number two, the challenge of creating structure in the absence of a job. Number three, the challenge of finding purpose in your journey. Community. Jobs provide a ready-made social life. They give you a social network. When you share struggles and achievements with co-workers, it creates a bond. Job-free lifestyles, in contrast, require you to take a more active role in creating a community for yourself. If you leave your job, you have to be more proactive about nurturing connections with people and creating a community around you. This can be especially difficult since your job-free lifestyle falls, by definition, outside the norm. Friedrich Nietzsche said, The individual has always had to struggle to keep from being overwhelmed by the tribe. If you try it, you will be lonely often, and sometimes frightened. But no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning yourself. 
Nietzsche beautifully captured both the pain and the worthiness of determining your life in that quote, but the quote also misses something crucial. We need allies in order to break from the tribe. Although we may like to think of ourselves as self-sufficient individualists, it's vital to create supportive relationships if you want to do something as radical as living free of jobs. Quitting the rat race to live job-free is a life-changing, long-term project. It is incredibly challenging, psychologically. Your network of relationships will partly determine whether you can meet that challenge. I encourage you to find support in your pursuit of a job-free life. You can connect with people online who share your goals. There are good forums for each of the four ways that I have outlined. You can join my Facebook group, and there are also discussion boards on the Early Retirement Extreme and Mr. Money Moustache websites. Although creating community for yourself outside a job can be a challenge, it is also an opportunity to find connections that are more authentic. You can devote your energy to connecting with people who inspire you, rather than hanging out with people just because they happen to work in the same place as you. You may lose the default community that comes with your job, but you can build connections with people who share your values. Personal Relationships The most important source of social support is your personal relationships. If you have a spouse or partner, their attitude will have a major impact on whether or not you succeed in creating a job-free life. This person can be your strongest ally in achieving your goal, supporting you both psychologically and practically. A supportive spouse or partner gives you protection against the pressures of conformity. If you don't have the support of your partner, your journey will be extremely hard. Justin, author of the early retirement blog Root of Good, explains why sharing the same goals as your partner is so crucial to your success. Quote, One of the biggest impediments to being successful at saving lots of money, growing wealth, and reaching financial independence is a spouse who is not on board. If you're working on building wealth and the other half of your household is working on spending that wealth, then they can probably spend it faster than you can grow it. You need to be on board with that common goal, whether it is retiring at 40 or just having a year's worth of cash in the bank in case something happens to one of you, if you lose a job or something. If there is not that common goal in place, then you are working in two different directions and one person is cancelling out the other person's hard work. End quote. Creating structure. Jobs provide structure for your life. They give you a place to go, a set of problems to work on and a routine to follow. We need structure in order to get anything done. Getting things done provides the intrinsic motivation of a sense of mastery over your life. When you don't have the structure provided by a job, you have to provide it for yourself. If you choose an entrepreneurial lifestyle, your level of personal organization can strongly influence your success. I am not naturally talented at task management or project management, but I realized early on in my business that these are crucial skills for entrepreneurs. I invested a lot of effort in learning about how to improve my productivity skills. The good news is that productivity skills are learnable. Even though they don't come naturally to me, I've been able to learn ways to manage tasks and projects effectively. I create structure in my life by relying heavily on productivity systems. For example, I use a task management application to organize all my projects and tasks. My use of productivity systems has been highly influenced by David Allen's approach, known as Getting Things Done, or GTD. Many other approaches to productivity can also be helpful. The key is not to worry about finding the best system, but rather to continually be working on the challenge of productivity. Creating structure for your life is an ongoing process. Productivity means moving towards your goals, so you can only be productive if you have goals. You can only have goals if you have a sense of purpose. Therefore, in order to be productive, 
You must identify your purpose in life. Finding purpose. If your job does not inspire you, striking out on your own can provide a great opportunity to live a more purposeful life. That was my experience in starting a business. As an entrepreneur, I did the work that was most meaningful to me. Now, in writing this book, I am following my purpose of encouraging others to find freedom. Many people want to quit their jobs, but they don't have a driving sense of purpose. They know that they need to create a source of income to replace their job, but they don't have any mission to guide them. If you quit a job to pursue any of the job-free lifestyles outlined in this book, you need a strong sense of purpose that can replace the default purpose that you got from your job. Don't underestimate the importance of this sense of purpose. Even an unfulfilling job can provide some mission without which life is hard. Jobs give you direction. Outside a job, it is up to you to provide that direction. Choose a path to job freedom that enables you to find purpose in the pursuit of your goal, not just in the outcome. There's no point in trying to be an extreme saver, for example, if you view saving as merely a hassle or an inconvenience. You will only succeed in that route if you find meaning in your journey towards financial independence, including all the lifestyle changes that go with it. The same goes for unjobbing. Building a lifestyle business or building a startup. All these approaches involve deferring gratification. If you can find purpose in your choice, then you can find joy in the journey too. You can find fulfillment in the pursuit of any of these approaches. You find fulfillment because by pursuing your goal, you are living your values. That is its own reward. In the vast, unthinking universe, we are so lucky to have consciousness. We have the choice of what to make of our lives. We can choose to free ourselves from jobs. We owe it to ourselves to take advantage of this amazing opportunity. It is easy to imagine that you will find a time in the future to do epic things, but your time is going to run out. The fact that we are all going to die is a wonderful motivation to get on with living life to the fullest while we can. The pursuit of a job-free life will enable you to live your highest purpose. Thank you for listening to the Voluntary Life. If you like this podcast, please show your support by becoming a patron of the Voluntary Life on Patreon. Your support will help to grow and improve the show. And you'll get access to a treasure trove of rewards, including bonus episodes. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to learn more.